All right, and we are live. Ooh. How you doing, Leo? How you doing? Doing yeah. well. Good to be here. Good to be. Here. Good to have you, man. I mean, this is the first podcast, uh, the first episode on this podcast. Yes. And I think it's pretty cool because the whole idea of doing this podcast came from our conversation about was it six, seven you months ago? You told me yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, was I was really visiting cool. Israel. We met for coffee. Yeah. And I remember, I remember you came to Israel. It was after a while you weren't here. Yes. And. I think a day before we did our meeting, you had an interview mm-hmm. on, the tel- on telly. And I was just taken by the fact that before the interview started, I knew exactly how long it's going to be, what kind of questions they're going to ask you, and almost exactly what kind of answers you're going to give. Yeah. And I remember we sat down, I think, the next day, and we just talked about how this topic of photography and art and storytelling and doing some of your like the amazing work that you do as a videographer. Thank and you. we kind of felt like, I kind of felt like there was so much more to talk about. There was so much more depth to mm-hmm. explore, which is something we just couldn't, was, it wasn't really possible, right? Yes. In a four minutes interview, yeah, 20 well, seconds. It also depends who you're talking to. I mean, when I'm talking to a colleague uh, and someone who I respect his art as well, Oy. we get to a different uh, depth. Yeah, um, my, my selfie game is real. That's for sure. Yeah, That's for sure. you're talking to a, a mainstream uh, television <laughs> interviewer. He wants to get your sound bites, you know, I came prepared, I gave them what they wanted, and yeah. off we went. But before we begin, because a lot of people who are going to see this podcast or hear this podcast mm-hmm. probably haven't read or went through your bio that we put out. So maybe you can uh, introduce yourself quickly to people sure. at home, kind of who you are, where you come from, what do you do, sure. so they have some sort of perspective. You want the, the short version or the, <laughs> the long one? We do have time if you <laughs> want right. to get into it, but <laughs> let's give like the elevator pitch, right? All let's right, let's all right, start all right. off. Um, so my name is Yos Pelandeo. I'm a visual artist. I use photography and cinematography for um, as my language of, uh, of art. Um, I started as a... There's a news cameraman in Jerusalem. Oh, have you? Yeah, chasing uh, terror attacks. That sounds fun. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, that's where I got the adrenaline, I guess. You know, as a, as a young uh, cameraman, uh, I fell in love with the adrenaline and the action. And as you grow, you, uh, you know, I, d- I developed and I went to the uh, documentary world and then... Um, I started also uh, to bring stills photography into my projects, and today I'm uh, combining, uh, you know, cinematography, uh, camera, ah, stills photography. So you kind of started writing. by doing news videography for different, um, I guess, pieces. Yes. And then slowly develop into documentary photography. Exactly, and something that really bat- battered me um, in, in news, it was always very shallow, very quick, and, you know, the news of today is... You know, the, you wrap the the fish for tomorrow in the market, yeah, as they I say. So I, I always wanted to get in depth. I always wanted to meet the person that in, is in front of my camera, and not only to get few sound bites and go home. Mm. Uh, and this is where I fell in love with with people, with encounters. You know. And what was the shift? Like, if you say you started from doing uh, television and yeah. kind of newsworthy work. What was the shift? What did you do? What kind of started your career and what you're doing today, which is more serious cinema, I would say. Yeah, I, I so I worked for a few years in, uh, in news. I uh, I quit my job. I did the whole phase of, you know, weddings and uh, small pieces for like companies and friends and whatever you need to do to, to survive. Yeah, to, to get by. Yeah, to get by. But also, you know, I must say that weddings is a great... Um, experience for a lot of uh i mean it's a great uh, news and weddings together are a great start for oh, a documentary it? uh cinematographer i don't know i i when i first started photography i was doing i was a military photographer yeah and i worked with one of my best friends and mm-hmm. he, w- he was doing weddings when he first started and yeah. i joined i think for two of them and after the beginning of the second one i was like i'm done yeah, I can't, yeah. i'm not good at it <laughs> no, i, don't I know what you it. mean i hate it <laughs> but you have uh uh outdoor conditions indoor light night your boss is the worst you can get <laughs> like a bridezilla a bridezilla you know but, wait, wait a second a lot, not a lot of people would actually know what bridezilla means can you kind of slightly describe how, how would you define what bridezilla is so a wedding day imagine yeah. a wedding day you come at noon uh, to get the bride put makeup on or whatever it is uh, you get into their house okay you're inside the family like beginning of the, of the day one, yeah. and the harmony of the and you're in the midst of of all of that, you're following her for the whole day, the the groom and the bride. Um, the stress, 
<laughs> you know, the just stress. Everybody's panicking. It's just ridiculous. They have, n- they don't know. Your boss doesn't know anything about photography for the whole day. Yeah. So um, it is, it, is, it develops something in you, uh, work under pressure. Uh, oh, so like the fact of you're working for a person who is supposed to somewhat manage you, but yet has n- doesn't have the tools for yeah, it. Yeah, I, and, I, and I became good at it, good at yeah. uh, explaining uh, what I'm doing and why we're doing it and trying to uh, calm them down. And I think I was pretty good at it, but how much can you do that? I mean... Yeah, there's, there's a limit for every person. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, so you finished this, you went into, f- into wedding photography. Mm-hmm. And how was the transition to doing the, the work you do today, the documentary work? So at some point I was uh, contacted by an American... Uh, uh, outlet company and that I worked with uh, as, as a news cameraman and they said we want to start uh, a documentary platform in Israel uh, and would you want to do it? Would you want to lead it? And I said great I just need a big salary, a big car and a couple of workers you know. Yeah. Uh, they said fine. We got oh, wait, a- They reached out to you to build that, that station for them. Yes, like from scratch. That, oh, uh, wow. and another station like uh, Machlaka, how do you say? Uh, yeah, the part, uh, station or uh, yeah. division. <laughs> so <laughs> you basically were in charge of starting off the local office. Yes, uh, for them the local Israel. office um, and, you know, starting to do documentaries. Now, I was very young. Uh, I said, yeah, get me like a 5D and a tripod, you know, a neck mic and let's do it. Uh, the first thing we did was about like Israeli invention in the fields of uh, agriculture and medical and high tech and whatever, it was nominated for three Emmys. Oh, really? And one of them was me nominated as for outstanding single uh, cinema photography. Oh, that's, wait, how old were you when that happened? Twenty four or something. Wow, that, that's, that was your kickoff. That was. I didn't understand what happens in the time. Like I didn't understand what an Emmy award is. I didn't. I was not there. I, w- I was too young for it. You oh, know? yeah. But no, I'm sure the pressure also to kind of, after being nominated for an Emmy and everything, to how do you continue from there? How do you build off from there? Right? Well, let me ask you. I mean, you had a, a huge success pretty young as well. No, no. Um, nothing like an Emmy, that's for sure. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know. I mean, as a, for a still photographer, a cover for National Geographic is a huge thing. Well, th- it was a huge thing for me. I still I still have in my drawer uh, the first check I got from. So, you know, you cash in the check, but you get this like document of a letter with National Geographic stamp on yeah. it. And it was the first photography project I've ever done, mm-hmm. right? So I guess I had a lot less um, kind of work built leading up to it. Mm-hmm. And I was ecstatic, but I think, I don't know, maybe it's just the way, the kind of weight you give to it. Because when I, because today when I hear, you know, publishing on National Geographic, I'm like, oh, yeah, all right, you can do that. Yeah. It's not that difficult. But Been the first time, for that. sure. <laughs> but the first time you do it, for sure, like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But to get an Emmy or be nominated for an Emmy, yeah. Emmy even some people who do it for... Nominated. We, we, I, we, I didn't win. Oh, I didn't win. All right. But still, I being nominated for an Emmy. I didn't even go. You didn't go? <laughs> no. <laughs> but still, I'm saying like being nominated for an Emmy, I think mm. so many people who do movies for a living yeah. can go throughout the entire career and never getting even nominated once. Yeah. Well, I guess documentary photographers who do documentary for a living, they're going to have a couple of times in their career where if they do it seriously and they put the effort to it, they'll yeah. get the National Geographic one way or another. Yeah. And Emmy is a whole different level, I think. I mean... Yeah. No, it, well, I mean, I, I was flattered. Um, yeah, but I didn't I didn't sit on it too much. I didn't like... You were at like, the time, Let's go, I didn't yeah. understand what it means, really. Mm. And also, it wasn't my project. I was embedded by a big corporation to do something they thought of. It wasn't mine. Mm. So it wasn't your baby. It wasn't my baby. But you did do a really, I mean, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of your first big videos that mm. really hit off, took off, was uh, People of Nowhere. Yes. Is that true? Is that fair to say? People of Nowhere, yeah. It was an explosion. Yeah, it was a boom. Why don't you tell us a little bit, uh, people at home who haven't watched the movie, if, if anybody's listening to this, do make sure as soon as you finish this boss gas, uh, just check out the video. It's amazing. I'm going to have yeah. links to it in the blog post before and definitely easy to find. But can you tell us a little bit what was it about and how it came to be? Yeah. So People of Nowhere is a few minutes piece about um, the wave of Syrian refugees to Europe. Um, now, I'm talking about the end of 2015. 2015, yeah. 2015. It's already four years ago almost. Yeah, it's quite a long yeah. time. And we're talking about thousands of Syrian uh, arriving to the shores of a uh, few Greek islands. I was in Lesbos 
and about 5,000 people a day arriving to this island, which contain only 60,000 people, wow. uh, Greek, you know? Um, so at the time, and also now, I mean, refugees, Europe, this is like the, the, the big political thing, right and left. You hear about it all day in the news and also me, I heard about it a lot, but arriving there and seeing it with my own eyes and seeing like children, like mm. elderly, like people, seeing it from a, a human perspective, suddenly it did something for me. It really broke my heart for at first and it, I wanted to do something. I, I didn't want to say what everybody already said and I also, I didn't want to push aside to it. I kind of wanted the, my, uh, I kind of wanted the viewer to decide for himself what he thinks, how, he feels, or how he feels about it. So there's no narration. There's only music and music and and images. Yeah, I mean um, the video is beautiful. But how did you get to a point where you decided to go there? How what was the thinking process like? So I was I was doing a documentary about uh, different NGOs. Uh, we followed the five NGOs for the whole year, um, and. And we did also something about an NGO that helped in uh, in Greek, mm. uh, a medical team, uh, Jewish and Arab together, a beautiful story by itself. But it wasn't enough for me. I stayed for another few days to do. Um, like after doing your your first video about the NGO, yeah, uh, I, I finished to, to do the the piece that I was there to do, uh, and I continue, and I and I wanted to also to have a personal peace you your, know. your own thing your own my thing. own thing and also i have i have an outlet it's called people of that i you know that i share human stories uh about but the, but did you, this thing of people off yes uh, did that start over there or was it existing before um it existed before i did two before but there it turned to be um a thing kind of i think but also it it, it what I'm looking for is the word <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because we speak in English we yeah. both speak in Hebrew you know it's a challenge to speak in English for a whole 15 minutes but to speak with someone who speaks Hebrew well you, well, you like, know you can cheat you your know, way through it trigger. Um, no in Lesbos what happened to people of it, it became a, it had a reason mm. finally you know because what happened after the film uh after the film got out, I got many responses that I didn't anticipate. Um, first of all, it was a huge success. You have to speak a little closer to the sorry, mic, because otherwise sorry, people sorry, at home sorry. would be like, oh Here my God, go. I can't hear anything. Yeah, sorry. Go. So first of all, it was a huge success. It was National Geographic, a Vimeo stuff pick. You know, Wh which one? What was? Uh, people of Nowhere. People of Nowhere. Yeah. Everybody loved it. You know, views, likes, shares, whatever. That number of success, it had. But more than that, um, I was getting messages from Syrian people who are saying, thank you for sharing our story. I was wow. getting uh, messages from governments who would want to use the film to, you know. Uh, for really? Their, yeah, for their uh, awesome. making de decisions. And then I said, wow, I really have a tool here. Mm. Not just pretty images, not just, um, you know, it's not just for me, for my glory and my being a, a great uh, cinematographer, but actually I have a tool. And if you have a tool, you have, you have a responsibility. I can make a change with this camera? Oh my God. Y you mean like it was one of the first times, or one of the most powerful times, where yes. you noticed that you could use your camera as a way to, to promote ideas and, and not just make something nice for a, exactly. a blog or a couple of likes on Instagram. Exactly, support. and that was the first time that I realized that. Uh, first time it hits you. The first time it hit me, yeah. All right, and yeah. also, let me ask this. There's something I was, because I watched the video yesterday before we did this, because I wanted okay. to kind of do a little, mm -hmm. you know, Re-remember, I guess. I haven't watched it for a while. You so. haven't? It's a really cool movie. You should check it out. No, but I'm saying... So the the video is a mixture of a couple of scenes, right? Mm -hmm. There is a couple of people just walking to camps and from camps, mm -hmm. uh, refugee camps, that exactly. is. Exactly. And there was a, a big majority of the film is a landing mm -hmm. where a bunch of ships just reached the shores. Yes. And you guys documented them. I mean, I don't know how long they've been in the water before they arrived, but it looks extremely powerful moment. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering... First of all, how was it for you to work in this probably very hectic and sensitive spot? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. also, how did you learn about it? How did you know to be in that time, in that place? Good question. Um, 
I mean, at that time, as soon as you arrive to to Lesbos, you you see it all over because there are refugees who are walking to the camps from the water. It's an it's a tiny tiny island. You can make it in a few hours uh, by driving uh, across. Yes. All right. Um, and you have big camps of Syrian and of mix, you know, Iraqis, Afghanis. I don't know how, what it what happens now, like four years after. It would be interesting actually to go and see. Oh. But um, at that time, it was it was chaotic. It was chaotic. A lot of organizations there, NGOs doing many things, medical, uh, cleaning the beach, you know, yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. Um, also uh, lifeguards. I met uh, a group of lifeguards from, uh, from Spain that you know when the waves get crazy they they swim and get people um off the boat and stuff um it was hectic you know these people are coming uh to the shore of turkey mm-hmm. and from there uh using this dinghy boat to get to uh lesbos which is it can be a six hour um journey, journey. from turkey to us to yes wow. but many of them lose their uh, engine on the way and get stuck in the water uh some uh you know you have you hear terrible stories of people drown there's this famous uh photo of the um, of the boy who got washed to the to the wow. shore you know uh, that's probably been one of the worst places for people to be i mean for, that's probably that's horrible it was I a mean, terrible no like problem, iconic uh, photo yeah yeah, yeah. they brought a lot of ten a, a lot a lot of human humanistic attention to the to, to that the, situation to that situation and not only a political one um which was refreshing at the time mm. but um yeah so i i i had a rental car and i was just you know looking at the water you see this little black dots of of boats and you just start driving and trying to meet to figure out where they're gonna land where they're gonna land and where they're gonna be um behind you there are like medics and people running journalists a lot of journalists um and sometimes there were some boats that comes together you know like 10 boats at the same time and then you can find yourself alone in front of a group of 50 syrian people and you're you're in front of them like welcome to europe you know (laughs) it's me and you and and a lot of ethical questions uh, arising at that time what yeah. do i do i take a photo i help a child to get out of the water i'm sure that's something that a lot of photographers over history had to deal with yes. right like um you meet a person in a dire need or in, mm-hmm. a, in a very tricky situation and you do have that question to yourself you know exactly. do i take that image i need to get if you're a professional if yeah. you work at it or yeah. do you put that aside for now and literally help the person in front of you it's yeah. a it's I know my answer to that dilemma, but it's definitely something to wrestle you with. You do? I would love to hear it because I don't think I have an answer yet. <laughs> oh, mine is super easy. Mine yeah. is like, forget about photography. I mean, mm-hmm. I think one of the things that I find most important for people to realize, especially when you do documentary or any kind of photography that deals yeah. with the human experience, when you work with people, is that I think a lot of times people forget the most important thing about photography, photographing people, that those are people. You know, mm-hmm. you're not photographing mm-hmm. yeah. a lion in a savanna or something. You're, you're talking to a person who has the same ambitions, the same hopes, the same feelings as you do. Mm-hmm. And I much rather ha- don't have an image. Be a human first. And be a, be a you know, have a friend. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love the fact that mo- almost every person I've ever photographed, I know them by name. Yeah. Right, I know their name, I know their age. Uh, some of them I still keep in t- contact with yeah. or I revisit after a while. Exactly. And I think it's very, very important for photographers, especially if you're not being paid for it, if mm-hmm. it's not your job to get that image, you're doing it for your, um, let's say, hobby, experience, yeah. Yeah, or just yeah. fun, to first enjoy it mm-hmm. and or first having the experience. And a lot of times when you do documentary photography or cultural photography, the experience you're looking for is getting to know a new culture. Yeah. So a lot of times getting that perfect image is in the way of getting the culture. Or in your case, what you're saying about the refugees, I don't know what was your idea, but if I were to do this, I wanted to help. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times helping could result in actually getting the image first. Yeah. Because that image, as you said, can have a big impact. Mm -hmm. But really trying to balance it out to, okay, how about I help you get off this boat first? Or I already got the shot I need. uh, Or good enough shot. Now let me actually uh, do the other kind of help. Exactly. No, it wasn't ethical uh, question that always um always rising. With, yeah, yeah 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 i mean i'm not a doctor it's not like i can go to someone and fix his leg 
you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you can you can give a hand to the doctors there. For sure. Uh, something for sure. that I that I have done, and also I realize that um, you know, it I relate to what you say because we are all human, and. I, I got really close to a, a doctor from Israel, a, a Muslim doctor, mm-hmm. um, who came and speak Arabic and was very connected to the to the Syrians and, and felt like, you know, it's the mission of his life to be there. Um, and I was, we got really connected. We're, we're friends still today. And I helped him out, you know, get me something from the bag, get me this, get me this. And, and also I asked him, get me an interview with this guy you know can you ask him something oh you gotta work together together and it was very rare because i saw so many journalists you know fight with eight workers on the beach and it was this tension between the you know people trying to get something in worlds two different worlds a journalist who wants to get the the worst photo and the aid worker who just trying to help Help. and we kind of worked together and it opened my mind to a new situation, which today I use a lot of, um, almost all of my access is through uh, humanitarian organizations that I work with. All the access to your projects. You yeah, mean. yeah, a lot of the access, you know, I'm doing uh, things about uh, the water crisis. So I go with... Uh, yeah, I actually wanted water. to ask you about this because I, I noticed that you... For me, personally, I don't know for a lot of people who know you or don't know you yet, yeah. um, you really came to the stage for me when I learned about your People of Nowhere, mm-hmm. which is the Syrian refugee mm-hmm. uh, video. But the more I looked at your work, and uh, actually we kind of met uh, by chance. We uh, did. We met yeah. in an airport on the way to Ethiopia. Yeah, we both were going to I Ethiopia at the time. Well. Like, we, we, didn't, like, we didn't know each other at all. No. But then you told me about People of Nowhere, and I saw it, and it was really, really beautiful. And then I've noticed in the past time since mm-hmm. um, you've been doing a lot of work a yeah. lot of it was doing enough Af- was done in Africa yeah uh, around water around albinos mm-hmm. and it was beautiful beautiful pro- project and I want to say that because I feel like you have a very certain interest mm-hmm. when you work and I wanted to explore maybe why do you find yourself attracted to these kind of certain populations I mean mm-hmm. you, you worked a project about this one your yes uh, you worked a project about uh, the lack of water in yeah. a couple of African countries yeah and you also worked on the albano population which mm-hmm. has their own kind of struggles in Africa and it seems like you have a certain theme you're running yes. on or, or not running on or you just find yourself naturally attracted to do you have any idea why why is that those are the topics that speak most to I you? think it all started from people of nowhere um, understanding that the camera is a tool to make to make a change to to grow awareness so why not using it uh for you know to help muted populations who need that voice you know who don't have uh, don't have a voice you come you give someone a voice that's such a powerful tool and i got hooked you know i saw the i saw the result i saw that it can change it can help and I started doing it. I started looking for communities who, you know, have, have a, a social issue, a human right uh, thing. Uh, I mean, we're, we're not hungry. We're, we're full. We're, we, yeah. we were born with so... S- slightly over full, me personally. You know, <laughs> yeah. So many opportunities and, and chances to do whatever we want. And I looked a bit to other communities and I said, wow, I mean, if I can help them, and share their story, what a wonderful thing to do. And um, so that's kind of what happened with people of, it became a platform for muted population, for social issues, uh, you know, uh, yeah. A way to kind of get the word out there. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, so when you say that, that sounds like, it actually sounds like the same way an addict Mm-hmm. would describe uh, liking heroin, right? It's like, yeah, I just started and yeah. I found like the rush amazing. <laughs> so I, I started looking wherever I can get it. Yeah. But that comes the question because it sounds like your interest in doing photography mm-hmm. is about using your camera, using your your end videos in yeah. a way, um, to promote an idea or to give a voice to somebody who might not have it other way. Yeah. But I also noticed that when you travel, you take just snap images, you know, portraits that you probably mm-hmm. either keep for yourself or maintain. Mm-hmm. And I think if we talked about, if I just said, you know, it sounds like an addict enjoying himself. <laughs> what do you enjoy most, right? Because do you enjoy the idea of traveling to see something you've never seen before? Or do you enjoy the idea of photographing, the actual work? 
or do you enjoy the most you know the final product and presenting it to an audience what yeah. what what do you feel more fulfilled with i'll tell you what i don't i'm not enjoying the photography <laughs> i'll tell you, you mean the secret. actual being out there and photographing no i don't have a dna of a photographer okay mm. i i didn't get a photograph uh, 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 a camera for my Swig 16. I never been in a dark room in my life. Well, I think there's a whole generation of photographers right now that unless you know, they go to uni, yeah, they don't know don't what a dark room is. I don't care about the brand of my of my camera. The, uh, on the contrary, a camera is something that blocks me from the the person in front of me. It's yeah. like this it's big thing. It's like a wall, thing. right? Yeah, it's like I need to look through something to see someone's eyes, you know? Mm. Um so no, I don't like the photography part, and also, um, with the year, I I do care more about how people see it and the results. But I love the way I love, I love being on in the field, and this is why I'm always on the field so much you, more than I'm at home. You mean like the traveling part, the actually being on the ground, uh, you the, know, the talking encounters. to the people. Talking to people, building trust, hearing their stories, you know, until I get the, the camera and equipment out of the, the car, um, I can spend days without the camera on my shoulder, uh, just get to know a community, uh, really get to know them because the results are much different when you build good trust. A, a relationship with a person. Well, yeah. actually, I'm going to cheat a little bit because okay. we, we talked before and yes. one of the things we talked about and absolutely liked it is I think a lot of photographers, amateur aspiring photographers or, you know, even professionals, they start to get the idea or they have always known the idea that if you build a relationship with the person you're photographing, the images will just get better. Mm -hmm. The story will be more interesting mm -hmm. and you'll be able to do more complex stuff. But you actually take it to the next level, are you? Which is? Because a lot of travel photographers, when they talk about their work, like, oh, I've been to like 57 countries. And, oh, but, I know where you're going yeah, with I know this. where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> and when we talk, I noticed that even though you travel a lot, I, I don't know mm -hmm. how many months out of the year, but... You, t I notice you travel a lot, yeah. and what you do, which I find amazing, is you don't travel to a bunch of different places all the time. You kind of come back again and again to the exactly. same countries or the same places, exactly. even to rework with the popu with the same people, or the same populations. Yeah. So, I, I guess it gets you a much deeper understanding. Yeah, yeah. Of that yeah. place, but how would you describe what, what? How do you feel when you build a relationship over time? What would be the biggest difference or advantage to your work? Yeah. So here is the thing. I'm. I'm really. I'm not. I'm not trying to collect stamp on my stamps on my passport. It's not. It's not what I'm doing. Um, I haven't been to so many countries, but the countries I've gone to, I'm just getting back to all the time. I'm loyal to the subjects that I'm to the issues that I'm presenting. Like I'll go back and back again. Um, it's something that I brought from uh, from film, actually, hmm. because when you say documentary photography, uh, you sometimes you think about a style, a certain style, how it looks. Hmm. Um, in film, documentary means process, mean following a process, coming back to it, uh, do a scene this year, and next year you do another scene for the same film. Oh, so you say like the biggest difference would be between, between documentary stills photography to videography is that. In a photograph, in a stills photography sense, it's more of a genre, like a style. Yeah. While in cinema, it's like a natural way of working. Exactly. Mm. So it was something that I just took from film and put it on the still photography because uh, it fitted. You know, um, for example, let's talk about the the water crisis. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I met this girl. Uh, she's called. She's her name is Amina. I met her in Tanzania in this uh, dry river. Okay, and she's going every day to get water for her family. Okay, so she digs a hole, get some jerry cans, you know, fill them up, put it on donkey four times a day, all day basically. For water. Yeah, for water. Okay. Um, I shot her village, a community, her. We talked. We did this whole thing. Um, and one if year after, I come back to the same village after they have a water project ready, you know, uh, this organization come and dig to the aquifer and pump water. Oh, like s somebody made a, a well for her village. A well for the village. I came before that to see what's the natural, what they do now, how they struggle basically. And then I came after to see the result. And after I came and she was not looking for water so where is Amina where is Amina I was looking for her you know I wanted to do some portraits of the after she's at school because she has time now to go to school because she doesn't have to get 
to worry about water. Oh, that's so awesome. You know? So for me, that's... That is documentary. I mean, putting process. aside documentary must have been awesome for you because if you if you knew the girl on name basis and mm-hmm. you actually build a relationship with her, it's probably been awesome for you also to see that things change, right? It's for the same sure. way you would have for a friend who his life is getting better. For sure, for sure. And and you know, I mean, all of Sub Sahara is uh, uh, facing a water shortage and a water crisis, and you know, women and children spend hours a day. Uh, focusing on you know survival survival and carrying cherry cans on their head um, while there's so much water coming from the sky and under underground mm. um, I wanted to promote it I wanted to promote there is a solution we're living in the time that we can fix a lot of the problems you know we are eating too much producing too much while 800 people 800 million people are going to sleep every year every day every day uh, hungry hmm. um, yeah that, I mean it, it's yeah. just crazy you know you know that more people I heard this statistic I'm I'm a f- I, I don't want to be wrong but um, so many people are dying because they eat so much um, well people are dying because they don't eat anything the huge contrast yeah one oh, world one small world and the huge contrast between the you know. once I mean I don't remember the statistics as well but I think I also read something about where obesity obesity is one of the causes of death one of the leading yes, causes of death yes yes, yes not too far it. behind from hunger yes yeah um, yeah there's a bunch of statistics about this I wonder I mean, if it, even yeah. more I would love to check it I want to check it now but I'm not gonna do yeah, it yeah you're not, not, <laughs> not now right now but we can check it out I mean I remember that um, the idea of I mean let's put it this way when you hear those statistics yeah. and you try to compare them into your day to day it's very hard but I think for somebody like you who actually travels and see it first hand uh, even though even if you fail or don't have the same ability to convey to somebody else mm-hmm. you see it yes you know it so right? when you say those statistics you don't have a picture in your head of you know the computer screen of that article who showed it you have a picture of your head of somebody you know yes who is struggling with it yes and yeah and I think work like yours especially who People who do it not because they have to do a piece for a magazine or something. They do it mm-hmm. because they're actually interested. Yeah. I mean, you pour a lot of your own time and your own budgets to I make this happen. I prefer to do it that way. I, I don't like to be embedded by anyone. Yeah. You know? So it's all self-funded, all yes. kind of self-initiated as well. I, I find ways to do it. I, I, you know, I also go and do jobs that I don't want to do, mm. uh, like anybody else I know. Yeah. Um, but I always combine it with a personal project, uh, a humanitarian uh, group that will pay me to do something. Um, I'm combining everything. That's also a form of art, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, bit- ma- making a living out of photography, that's art. Yeah, I, th- I think <laughs> I think a lot of people when they think about art, art occupation, right? I do, I do photography for a living. I, yeah. do, I do art for a living. Doing art, doing creative work goes hand with hand with being also very, very creative in the way you can actually make a living out it's of true. it. It's true. It's true. I think I actually recently wrote uh, a blog. Mm-hmm. I, it came to my attention. It was almost precisely 10 years ago that I started photography. I was drafted in 2009 uh, to the army and then stationed as a military photographer. Yeah. So I decided to write this like 10 tips. Uh, for photographers, uh, things I wish I knew 10 years ago. I feel like I've seen it. Uh, but maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but one of the tips I wrote there was like, if you want to make a living as a photographer, if you want to mm-hmm. become a full-time photographer, painter, singer, whatever it is, you have to do more than just photography. Exactly. You have to be able to offer whatever it is that you do in exactly. a more diverse way and kind of figure it out because yeah. it's not a fairy tale, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like you get to do whatever you like and, yeah, you know, that kind of works. You have to kind of balance it out, right? Exactly. But... Yeah. Let's put it this way. Let's like kind of. I want to take a, a focus on something else. Okay. Because um, you know we can always uh, I don't know bitch out on <laughs> how you have to do certain stuff you don't want to do. Yeah. Teach workshops you might not enjoy, mm-hmm. or actually do projects which are amazing, but you have two days to do. I would actually want to focus more on the other side. So okay. let's say you just did um, you, you, putting aside how you afford it. Out of the projects you've done so far. What was the most rewarding experience you got through them? Like, mm. what if you were to put your finger on, you know, I did this project and this and this happened, and I was really made me feel, you know, amazing or interesting on mm-hmm. my, myself. Where would you station that in your career? So, uh, first of all, how do we measure success? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, success is numbers, or is it? Uh, 
is it a personal achievement because um it really you know with social media and the numbers and engagement and likes and followers and all that we can get confused with how how we measure success and it's it's important to remember that if you do what you love and you make a living out of it you're successful already well yeah definitely um yeah. i mean it depends what kind of living you make yeah? if you end up uh working your ass off and feeling like you're just losing out um it's yeah. a little tricky but I, I, if you enjoy I, I, what I'm you do i'm not planning to get rich out of it so wait, oh yeah, let's, let's <laughs> so make, i don't have that burden <laughs> well, wait, let, let's make this thing straight i mean correct me if i'm wrong i don't know if any photographer who got into photography because he wanted to get rich or even if he did i don't know if any photographer who made it right yeah, like, i mean n- not our type of photography yeah for sure. no no photographers are rolling yeah. like with mansions and bmws and whatever for sure, so, yeah, for sure. <laughs> no but some projects like, for example let's take the people of, of albanism um so that's is, a project you did can you just explain a little bit what was that project about so in um in east south uh, africa albanism is a huge thing um there's this primitive idea superstition of uh you know using organs of people with albinism uh to make cure for good luck and uh, oh wow health and yeah well, what, what are you talking about stuff like what like using their hair for like a potion you know, or something cutting or? hands oh uh, actual limbs oh yeah they they kill them for the for being albinos Um wow. yeah it's it's crazy it's 2019 yeah it happens still today last yeah, that week sounds like something last week in Malawi was uh, they found the body of uh, of a person with albinism wow. uh yeah it's what just torn apart torn apart without his private parts oh yes and Ugh. yeah and like i don't know i don't know who is making i don't know who is behind nobody knows understand who is behind it but it's it's an old primitive idea um of what like the they have m- what like special attributes their organs yeah, or using their organs to make a, a cure or um uh, like a shikui how do you say potion <laughs> like, like you want them people actually oh wow yeah so like potions it. out of their limbs yeah and, and and if you drink it you you'll have good luck and you'll become rich or something it's it's a super, super that, that's crazy that's yeah crazy. and it happened today and i read this article in the new york times you know the scary article about this whole thing and i said okay i need to go there i need to help these people uh it's i was i was hooked uh mm. and i said okay i came to malawi for one week um spend a lot of money because you're not gonna there, there are before they're hiding from this crazy idea they're hiding from the sun oh. they're hiding from you know from, from the light they they right, right. they have eye problems sometimes they their skin is sensitive you know so they're already hiding from from from, from the physical uh just by yeah just the lifestyle yes uh much before this crazy idea and that's what what i realized then it was like wow these people are suffering like from all, every direction what is going on here uh and i needed to find them in their own houses so i i got connected to the association of uh, people with albinism in malawi and they gave me addresses and we said let's do a campaign together and billboards in malawi and then i'll do a film and photos and blah 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 blah, blah. we worked so hard came back the result was a failure okay and well, what was it a failure what was the what was missing well nobody watched it oh <laughs> nobody watched it nobody cared what like it was too far from reality it was too like i don't understand it i can't relate to it because it's too crazy that's that's the you results mean, that i got you mean like the final video and images you made didn't have the same effect on people didn't have an effect at all because um, what because they just couldn't connect, connect to it it was too far fetched for them too far magazines thought it's too uh graphic or crazy or the timing wasn't right or they already did something about it from in a in a different country or they did something about it last year um so f- i thought okay wow that's a huge failure but then i i kept going i kept like trying and i kept and, and i'm talking to you about like two years after i did it um suddenly it got it got 
uh, it got exploded. It got it got you know somebody picked it up. Somebody picked it up because I did a different project, and through that, it got to this project. Uh, magazines shared it. Israeli press suddenly cared about this issue, and I, we did a few stories. And also, the the interview that you saw was a part of it. Following uh, that one part, um, yeah. And today I'm uh, like I'm shipping like sunglasses to Malawi, sunscreen. Um, oh, wait, 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 what do you mean? What do you mean shipping? You say shipping your glasses? Pro- it's not just a photography project. It became uh, it became a mission. It became something I want to do, a community that I want to help, and I don't want to help them only with awareness. Uh, so through the articles that went out recently. I raised, you know, in social media, I just ask, you know, if you have a spare sunglasses uh, or sunscreen, you know, finding sunscreen in an African country is not an easy thing. Um, yeah, I would, <laughs> I would assume it would be everywhere, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, uh, yeah, so people send me stuff. Wait, so you, you shared it online, you got the, ex- for some reason it just got, it just popped, right? Yes. Like people started watching it. And what you're saying is that you use your social media contacts, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, whatever, mm-hmm. to say, you know, if you have any spare sunglasses you want to give away or sunscreen, yeah. and people send it? Yeah, I felt like it, it's not, it wasn't enough just to do a photography project because, you know, you, you see this, I don't know, this kids, amazing kids going to school uh, with 5,000 people with in a different color, facing, you know, bullying and, and what's not, and I wanted to help, you know, I wanted to do more than that. I wanted to do a little more. And yeah, so I, I did this post on Facebook. I said, please, like, send me stuff if you have. Like, who who doesn't have another sunglasses somewhere thrown, you know? Yeah. Um, For them, it's gold. And they need it. So you're basically, how many sunglasses did you collect, you know? So this company, uh, <laughs> uh I got, you know, f- here and there, like, dozens. And then this company contact me and said hey we want to help too so they just sent like 100 a sunglass company yeah. yeah what's the company i mean i mean if they did something so awesome we need to give I'm their so name i'm so embarrassed out. because i don't know <gasps> you don't remember but here's the link below yeah <laughs> i mean yeah we'll definitely put a link down in the blog post uh, to check Please out the company do. i mean if a company does something so yeah it's, awesome it's, a, fr- and sweet. it's a friend in on facebook that's is working for a company and right. yes of course well we, we highly apologize for not knowing the company name but I mean, it's awesome to see that people actually. I will make sure company. to thank them in the. For sure, for know. sure. So you're basically shipping how many glasses? So now I'm shipping uh, 250 glasses. 200 glasses. Yeah. I was thinking going to tell like 30, 50. You think? No, I mean it's a, it's, a, it's a big box, and wow. I'm, I'm shipping it this week. It's my sister's house. So oh, wow. I'm I'm visiting Israel. I don't live here. Uh, is it so? Is it really profitable? Like manageable to send all these glasses to Israel? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have a contact. I have a good contact there. Yeah, a good contact. I have a good contact with the Association of People with Albanism in Malawi. They're excited oh, yeah, about yeah. it. No, I'm asking um, because I used to live in Mongolia for a while yeah. and I go there almost every year. And one of the problems I face is that the way the post office work in certain countries yeah, yeah, that yeah. are not China, for China is amazing, but in Mongolia, if you send a package over the mail, you have two problems. Yeah. One, it's probably not going to get there like it's going to get lost on the way or mm-hmm. somebody say, you know, like forget about it. Like, and it's going to come six months later or that somebody who is supposed to pass the package forward, especially when you go deep country, they go like, oh, that's actually really nice glasses. So he's going to take like out of the 200, yeah. you know, 100 for himself. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of weird, right? So when I had to no, ship for something sure, for friends for sure. or something, I always prefer to carry it with me. Oh, for sure. I would, I would prefer to buy it there, but mm. we were looking for sunglasses with like, UV, you know, like proper the real because deal. they real they really need it. They yeah. really need it. And a lot of times when you travel, they sell like I mean, sunglasses shops are probably the most common thing in the world. I would say for sure. But a lot of times those are fake glasses, oh, you right? Have no so idea you what you're just buying. ruin your eyes. Oh my god, yes. Because you think you're safe, but then you <laughs> yes, really aren't. Yeah? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, for sure. But it, it's really sweet to see that you're actually doing. Let's put it this way: if you use your photography, and other photographers say that, right? Like, I'm I'm helping them by raising awareness, which is true. Mm-hmm. I mean, r- good work, good interesting stories it can really yeah. help a lot yes. people just with awareness. But you're taking the extra step, right? You you not only helping with your work, you're actually finding out how to get help and get you know if it's donations like those sunglasses and other stuff. Yeah, I mean. I, I don't like to to look at it as like I'm 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 coming as a savior or something like that, yeah, like yeah. A, a white savior to Africa yeah, or anything yeah. like that. I really I form a relationship. You know what it is mm. to form a relationship that is so strong that you 
you know, you give and take and and so well, it, it comes natural. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, for sure. I mean, if you know the person and you kind of relate to the problem, it's the same yeah. way you do with any friend, right? You have a friend who has a little issue and then you you help them out. Yeah. But if you say it's a give and take, let's ask this one. Like, what was the most rewarding experience you had mm. by doing this? Like, if you say, I mean, it sounds like you're giving them, inf- uh, you know, your images, you're giving them exposure, mm-hmm. literal stuff they need. Yeah. What would you say your career as a photographer for the past few years has given you most? Like, what is you, the most rewarding well, thing you got from it? So here's the thing, um, and it's something that I will share with you, but I would not share it with any other interview because... Oh, we feel special now. Because Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because you might, you might relate. I hope you will relate. Yeah. Um, my, my, journeys is, my journeys to these, all of these countries and this constant traveling and moving and, and moving around... It's not just because I'm trying to go and help and do these projects. I'm also looking for something. Um, it's it comes from the past. It's much more personal. I I didn't survive uh, the the education system or any system in my life. Uh, I always needed to move and to search. And I, you know, I don't have uh, any degree or education or anything like that. Um, this is my university, the world. Um, meeting people i don't need someone with a lot of possession to you know to to be i mean people don't have possession but they're super smart that's what i'm trying to say Mm. and these are the people that i want to learn from um yeah so in a way it's a personal journey it's a personal uh, constant search for something well, um, it's super interesting because what you're saying basically is a real. I think it's a. I can translate a pretty good advice because a lot of people want to do photography. They want to mm-hmm. do something, yeah. Um, and they're very caught up with the question: Should I go to university to study it, or should I just go ahead and do it? Mm-hmm. And I think when you do the kind of occupation of travel photography, documentary photography, cultural photography, every, any kind of photography that takes you out of your elements, yeah, it's the same way as going to university, isn't it? Because when you travel to another country, you learn about its geography, you learn yeah. about the culture, uh, whether you like it or not, right? If, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. if you go to any country that has a very different time uh, spam, right? Uh, exactly. Then you, you kind of react to it. But yeah. also I think the kind of work, uh, I, I do it for sure. I feel it on my work as, I mean, especially, but I'm, I'm sure you do it the same. Because you work with different worlds, right? You work with worlds who have a very different lifestyle than yours mm-hmm. and history you kind of end up doing homework, right? You kind of end up learning history and anthropology and, sure. and aesthetics and the kind of stuff you would go to university to study, yeah. al- only now you do it by yourself because you have to, you right? You have to, you have to. Before you get to a place, when you're there, um, yeah, if you want to get close, like really, you have to know You have to know the past. You have to know, uh, you know, you, go, you yeah. go to these African countries that are pretty new, I mean, yeah. but what the past is so rich. Um, I mean, the history of the place, yeah. The history, the proverbs that comes from the place, that the from for generation to generation, their past, uh, from mouth to ear, it's fascinating. And the thing is that if I wasn't a photographer, I would still go, be in those places. As some, a backpacker, yeah. Yeah, as something. I'm not sure as what, but yeah. Well, being a backpacker, is, it sounds really magical, but once you do it once or twice, you kind of want to do it again as a rich person. Yeah? Isn't like, no, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm not a backpacker at all, actually, yeah? but I would, I, I would be something. I don't know, uh, an aid worker. I don't know what. Um, mm, the thing is that photography is my ticket to get to these places. I w- I, I, I'm fascinated about these places. So, so what you're saying is basically that if you weren't doing, a, uh, as a photo- if you weren't doing it as a photographer, you would end up working on the same topics and reaching the same areas, just, you know, in a different way. I feel like way. it. I feel oh, like it. Because that's really cool. Yeah. So that means you actually found a way to work on your calling. Uh, the exactly. way you see it now. This is why also I'm enjoying the way and not just the result. I'm not, I don't need to wait for my result to be happy about my, the project or not. I'm already happy in the making of it. Oh, um, that's awesome. And this is where, you know, I realized I, I'm, I'm where I need to be. Well, that sounds awesome, man. And it sounds like something very good to have and very rewarding to have to yeah. kind of do the kind of work that you enjoy doing and gaining so much from it. Mm-hmm. And I want to go back to something else you said before. And I think it's one of the main reasons why I wanted to start this podcast with you. I mean, this is the first episode, as we said, and our conversation kind of started the idea 
of, of doing this podcast, this long-term conversation on photography. But one of the things that I found most fascinating with your work is that you kind of live on the edge. Live on the edge in terms of photography because one of the things that a lot of people miss out on how photography projects are done or how a story is done is that thing that most people think that, you know, uh, you travel very far, you reach this exotic place with an interesting story, yeah. you work on it, and that's it. Like, you're done. You, you did the piece, it's out. And I always say that documentary photography, especially documentaries or cultural, yeah. are organic things, right? The more you can work on it, the For more sure. you can develop it, uh, the better it gets, and you do it to the extreme, right? You you come to the same place three, four, five, six times, mm -hmm. and that's absolutely amazing. And that's why we started. I mean, we said before about the Water Girl, right? Uh, you, I, I checked your Facebook before you got here. You got this tattoo made, right, on your ankle. <laughs> I did. Yeah, which is kind of cool. <laughs> Just a couple of days. Ago, yeah, yeah. So, the for people who don't who haven't seen it or don't know, one of the way that people uh, collect water, especially in the pro in the places where Lior worked on his videos, what well, was is with these huge plastic boxes, right? This yeah, yellow box. Yellow jerrycans. Yeah, yellow jerrycans. Jerry and you yeah. tattooed it on your ankle. I did. That's that's commitment. I'm that man. serious. <laughs> that's commitment to your to your story, man. That's really yeah. cool. But yeah, yeah. so I, I think one of the things that from you is just to see how organic those things are. I mean, if you continue mm -hmm. walking in the next few years to the same places, the projects will grow. They yeah. won't repeat themselves. What do you see for, I don't know, your next 10, 20 years of work? Wow. Um, not in terms of what you're going to do, but where would you want your career to grow? Mm -hmm. Where do you see that going? Wow, that's, it's a really big question. And it's also so, um, uh, con con contrary? Like, contrary? What do you mean? What do you mean? Uh, I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, well <laughs> what I'm I'm learning is, I I I do live on the edge. I must say, and also it's on my scheduling, also how I book. I need to be in a few days. I need to be in Uganda. I don't have a ticket yet. I don't know. Ooh. Yeah, it's like it's really being on the edge, and I'm getting it from the culture because. Mm. When you go to a place, you know it. You go to a place, to a third world country, doesn't matter where, they have their own time. Yeah, for sure. Scheduling time. An hour doesn't mean, you know, 10 o'clock doesn't mean 10 o'clock. Yeah, some <laughs> countries, if you want to do something at 10 o'clock, you have to schedule a day before. Yeah. Like, let's meet yesterday. <laughs> exactly. And I get to a place that I'm, I'm starting to lean to that mentality a little bit. Mm -hmm. And also in the way that I book, um, it's everything is last minute. Like we mm. talked about this podcast m months ago, you know, yeah, months ago. ago. But only yesterday I kind of took it seriously because it happens tomorrow. <laughs> well, thank God. Yeah, thank God you. <laughs> it'll be hilarious if we did all this get waiting for you. I'm like, oh, it's today. All right. Yeah. No, no. I, I am, I am a, a serious uh, dude. But you know what I mean. I it's, you kind of live from the moment. Yeah. Me. It affects me. The culture affects me in my personal life. Like when people ask me what I'm going to do and what I'm going to be and where I'm going to be, I must say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I will be <laughs> and I'm not sure uh, if I'll still use photography as the, as my visual language. Oh, you're not sure? Maybe you want to expand on something into something else. I'm open. I'm open. I don't like to limit myself. I'm, well, I'm just open for well, everything. I'm definitely excited to see where you go, man. I mean, it sounds like you're doing amazing work. Uh, your videos, your images are simply breathtaking Thank and, I, so and i'm so happy to for us to have this conversation i mean it's Asher, been awesome i'm sure our uh, our path will cross at some point one day one day yeah. maybe not too soon right let's let's give ourselves <laughs> some break but, but anyway what i was saying is that i mean you're doing amazing work Thank you i so can't much. wait to see what will be your new project Thank you so and much. i do wish you all the best of luck in the way but for people at home or people watching this mm -hmm. um if they want to check you out if they want to keep posted what, what else are you going in your life what do you have coming up or what would you like to recommend so, them to check out? So this year I'm going to go to uh, South Sudan in, on April to a few refugee camps wow. and do a project there about um, there's a group. Well, never mind. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to. Yeah, that's not going to give too much. But of it. if you want to uh, get updates, uh, you should uh, follow me on Instagram. This is where I'm most active at people of. And yeah. Yeah, we noticed though we, before we started this podcast, you keep <laughs> hitting us with stories and videos <laughs> of it yeah but all right cool so check out your instagram you have also have a website right yes. is that correct you have a email which is really cool to check yes. out um and yeah if people want to keep posted check you out on there follow you up please and i hope you do amazing work thank and you so much. i can't wait to see what next you'll do and thank you so much for being on this podcast man
been a thank pleasure. Thank you too. Thank you, man. We'll love to see you at what you, you so do much. as well. I love what you do. Oh, right, thank you. Um, well, let's see, huh? All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, and I think it's a wrap, right? That's that'll be it. Cheers. Cheers, man. <laughs>